Hello, everybody, and welcome back for another episode of the show. My name is Christian Pavarelli, and I'm the founder and CEO of We Are No Code. And in this series, we really get deep into founders, first-time entrepreneurs, and how to build startups. And there's no one better to talk about this than Dave Parker, my guest today. He is a serial entrepreneur. He has been the board member on a number of different companies. He has also become an investor through his success in entrepreneurship, has also recently, and in one week, will officially be an author of a book uh, that he will tell us a lot more about. He's a startup specialist. He's been a mentor for Techstars. He's been a mentor for Founders Institute. He's worked with uh, Startup Bootcamp. I, I can't even sort of mention everything. We'll be here for half an hour. Dave, thanks so much for coming here and sharing your expertise and your time with all um, of the people. Super glad to be here, Christian. Thanks for having me. I really, really appreciate it. It's, it's super fun. Yeah, no, this is going to be great. So let's dig straight into it. Dave, why don't you tell me about what you're kind of working on, what Get Trajectory is, and then the other things that you're working on at the moment. Yeah, so Get Trajectory is the, the Trajectory series is the title of the new book series. So book number one is Trajectory Startup. And it really covers the, sta the stage of the startup from ideation to product market fit. Right, because the idea there is that if you have an idea and you're not sure if you should leave your day job, what do you need to know before you leave your benefits or before, hopefully before you got laid off with the, with COVID? What, what do you need to know before you make the leap? Right. So it's good that you have a hunch, and it's great that you're passionate, but passion alone and a hunch with no data um, is why 75 to 90 percent of startups fail. So the book really takes on the topic of what what can I do over the next four to six months to really validate the idea and understand how I'm going to make money so that I can, when I make the leap, I can make the leap intelligently versus just like, I have a hunch. And a lot of that Christian came from my time. Um, I used to run global programs for Startup Weekend, which was up global was the name of the company. So Startup Weekend, uh, Startup Week, Startup Next, Startup Digest were all the products that I had as a senior VP of programs. And had a great chance to join a team that had built a movement. And I really give the team all the credit. I just got to come in and help scale some things up. And before we sold that company to Techstars in 2015, we did 1,265 events worldwide with 74,000 attendees. And I was kind of like this startup weekend is, it's, it's pick up basketball for startups, right? So people would show up and they'd be super excited and they come out of it and they're like, I met my co-founder, Christian and I are going to go start a company. We're going to leave our day jobs. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> like, before you do that, like, there's some things. Slow down. <laughs> yeah. And there's some things as a, as a serial founder that I'd be like, you would want to know. Like, mm -hmm. oh, somebody's already raised $100 million in that market. Mm -hmm. That would be good to know. Or, yeah, you know, that's like, I would love to have a hoverboard. That would be so rad. Except Absolutely. I can't build one yet. So you like leaving your day job to go start a hoverboard company would be an epic example of failure, right? Yeah. And it's not because I have a lack of passion. I'm super passionate about it. I want a hoverboard. I think they'd be cool. Yeah. But so yeah, that was that was kind of the both five time founder myself and seeing that gap was really book one in the series and it's focused on I have an idea, what do I do? And I want to get the product market fit so I have a sustainable business. And yeah. That's Get Trajectories the website, and book one will be out March 4th. I submitted it to the publisher last week. So to your point, I will technically have an ISBN number um, and be on Goodreads and, and as an official author in about a week. So it feels like I've been – it feels semi-anticlimactic because it took so freaking long to write it. But yeah. it's, fun to, uh, it's been a fun process for sure. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, my brother's also an author, and and like you go through so many revisions and so much work that by the end you're just like just to release the thing. It's not like movies, right? And you shoot it and you're excited, and then like afterwards it's just like months go down, and you're just like yeah, in in, all, in the weeds for so long. Is still super old school, right? They're like, well, we have a fall season and a spring season, and we need to get you know dead trees all lined up, and I'm like. Why does that still happen that way, right? Can't if because it feels like this is a, a very timely topic. You know, a lot of a lot of people have been forced into a situation where they're looking to go create their own jobs or create a company, and, uh, and so the timing is good. But it still is one of those where like, and we'll rush it out March fourth. 
right? And you're like, oh my God, that still seems like far away. Yeah, it, it seems like when you, uh, you know, you sign the book deal, they start planting the trees to basically be able to publish your book on. <laughs> and then by the time that the trees have grown and they've, yeah. Yeah, turn them into paper, got to make them into pulp. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just a long process, but that's great and super exciting. It might not be that climactic for you, but I think for everyone else who will get access to this book, it's going to be super exciting. Um, okay. So let's, I think the next big thing that I want to talk about, because this is a, an area where you're just a specialist. You've basically, you know, and there are these 14 different business models that mm -hmm. basically are these categories that every single startup's revenue model kind of falls under, right? Um, you are a specialist in that. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And uh, is that also part of the books? Um, yeah. So one of the things that came up, so this is kind of the, I'll give you the backstory on how we got here. So I was running Founder Institute in Seattle and I ran like five cohorts of that. And at one point, Kristen, someone came to me and said, hey, can I have your financial model? And I'm like, well, yeah, like you, I'm, I'm, the, I'm a very community oriented guy. And I'm like, if, you know, I'm, I'm happy to give you whatever tools I have. But I'm like, but your revenue model is a marketplace and my revenue model is a subscription and those are fundamentally different. Like they have some, some similar things and there's some similar metrics that ma matter in both, right? So it got me started on what at the time was a fairly innocent question. It was like, I wonder how many templates you would have to build to be super useful to startup founders. And so the CEO of Crunchbase was a friend or is a friend and, and this is before their API. So I went to him and said, hey, can you just give me a list of like, every seed funded company in the last 18 months. Well, come to find out seed equal seed one to seed 10. And there were 2,654 companies. And wow. started this six year, what became a longitudinal study with no intent, mind you. It, was not, it wasn't designed as like, I shall go on a quest to understand revenue models. Because it's super geeky and nuanced, right? So, but the, the idea there was which ones are most successful, which ones are hard to do at launch, which ones only work at scale. Um, so, uh, yeah, I ended up doing this research project and tracking these 2,500 companies over the five plus year span and looking at which companies, uh, were most successful. Um, and I would define success by speed from seed round to a round and from a round to B round. And then we plotted them on the chart, uh, and then which ones failed and what was, what could you unpack about their failure by using a tool, um, on the internet archive called the Wayback Machine. So one of the things that we did is we, if somebody had went out of business, we went back and looked at their last cached pages on the Wayback Machine and said, what do we, what can we uh, um, kind of understand about why they failed or what did they have in common with the other companies that failed? So the net result of that research project represents probably 20, 25% of the book, which basically breaks down here are the 14 revenue models for tech. Um, by the way, it includes services. One of the big surprises in there were combination revenue models uh, matured almost four to five times faster than singular revenue models. So if you do services plus subscription or subscription plus transaction fee, uh, right, those business models matured way faster than uh, a singular business model, which is totally contrary to what VCs tell you, right? So having been a VC, it's like, pick one revenue model and stick with it. Uh, that's actually not true. But it's, you know, it's taken one of those things, it's like, it's the gospel, according to venture capital, so if you do services work, so I'll give an example, here in Seattle, there's a company called uh, Smartsheet. And Smartsheet basically took, rebuilt an Excel platform from scratch, hosted it in the cloud, and does everything that you don't do on Excel for this calculated, like a project plan or a moving schedule or, right? And they 25% uh, of their revenue, um, they're publicly traded now, is service revenue. So they have professionals. And what they found is it compressed their sales cycle. So if you have to use, if you're going to use my product, but you don't have anybody trained for my product, by having professional services staff that we make a good margin on, um, we actually compress the sales cycle, and our and those customers use our product faster. So having non-recurring engineering or what's called NRE or having services revenue, it's a great way for you to prove that um, the customer actually cares about your product. But you can do that in tandem with a subscription service. So, that is fascinating. My God. That is really, really uh, interesting. Um, first of all, let me take a step back and yeah. say that the work that you've done is absolutely insane. 
to have tracked that many companies for five years to be able to come down and basically create, you know, discover these 14 different business models that now every single entrepreneur can have access to and can actually like study from other people's successes and failures with those same business models. That's insane. So that just, first of all, for the startup community, we salute you and thank you for that <laughs> because it's work that we don't have to do. Uh, now, I love this idea of having uh, two business models that support each other. And I love this idea that um, they can actually reduce the sales cycle as well. Um, before we get a little deeper into that, could you tell me, um, maybe kind of spell out some of the, uh, the models that you've found to be the most successful? Yeah, um, and the ones that work really well at launch, and I'll contrast them to the ones that only work at scale. And that's an interesting thing as well. If you could talk about that idea that some business models are great to begin with, but not might not be the best for when you're kind of growing out your business. Yeah, so uh, some of the most obvious are commerce, right? So when you're selling somebody else's product at a margin, think Amazon, mm -hmm. uh, or Amazon early days before they became a marketplace. So from a commerce perspective, your key metrics on commerce is what's your average basket size, what's your gross margin, and how many transactions you're going to do a month. So you're able to look at your KPIs and go, are, is the business growing or is it flat or is it going down? But commerce is one of those that's super easy, right? It's And it's pretty easy to calculate the economics for. Um, services um, have bill rates and pay rates. So if you think services, it's engineering would be a great example of somebody doing billable work. Um, I have a pay rate, which is what I'm going to pay Dave to do the work. And I have a bill rate, which is what I'm going to charge Dave to, to deliver uh, to the customer. So the customer is going to pay me $100 an hour and I'm going to pay Dave $50 an hour and I have a 50% gross margin. Yeah. So and then you get into subscriptions and, uh, and what's called metered services, which is the only new one in that five-year span. Um, so subscriptions are pretty easy. It's Spotify as an example um, and Salesforce on a B2B example. But if you th thinking about this on a four-quadrant box, I have uh, B2B and B2C on the top and I have products and services on the side. So if I'm a product company, I can make money when I sleep, right? So somebody can buy the product. If I'm a service company, for every new customer I add, I have to add people. So that's the difference between a service business and a product business. But it's also the difference between business to business, Salesforce, and business to consumer, like Spotify. Yeah. So And investors kind of look at it that way and say, I invest in these sort of things. Like I like B2B commerce or I like B2B subscriptions. The challenge with subscriptions, as you well know, is that the it's hard to track my, I'm going to spend $100,000 and get three engineers and we're going to build this or a million dollars. doesn't really matter what the number is. But now I'm going to take payment on a monthly basis of $199 a month. So I've got a million dollars in development costs, which I amortize over three years. And I have subscriptions. So my very first customer is basically the most expensive customer there and they're not going to pay me a million dollars. They're going to pay me $200 a month. So, but the thing that I love about that business is if, if it really works well, then a thousand people will pay you $200 a month. And now I can calculate what's called sales efficiency. How long it took me to build a product, sell the customer until I get positive return on that customer sale. So it, it's harder to calculate because the math isn't as simple as ours, right? And pay rate and bill rate. But it also scales dramatically where services just don't scale dramatically. So subscriptions is one of them. Metered service is the, is the next one. So metered service, think Twilio, think AWS or Azure, right? Which is, it started as a subscription service, but the more you use, the more you pay. Yeah, and so that's a tiered approach. Yeah. In, the, in the last five years of watching it. There was one called Coins and Tokens, but ultimately if there's no way to track a metric, Right, and a conversion metric, or the answer was well, both the SEC said, "Hey, you can't do that," and there was no metrics to track it. So, though I had it in there initially, uh, we ended up pulling it out for the book because it was like, mm. so you see on the blog post, I'll send you. It'll say the 16 models because Google's already indexed that site super high. But if you search for startup revenue models, you'll come up with. I think my blog post will be first or second, depending on the day. Um, so, and then it, they, they start to get more complex. So for example, with marketplaces, a marketplace is a distinct revenue model. I have buyers and sellers. I have to have key metrics on both sides. There's a cost of acquiring sellers to get inventory so that as I acquire buyers, I can connect them and take a transaction fee. So revenue, that's one as well. 
Um, there's one called productize the service. And the idea of productizing the service is we can automate the front end of the sales process where we have lifetime value and cost of customer acquisition. And then I can deliver, I can skew up and sell a product as a fixed price. And people are in, in charge of making that product work. But the customer doesn't care how many hours or how many people or how many how best the process is. So by productizing the service, I can use the automation of customer acquisition that most tech companies use. But I can also use tools and tech in the back end to help me deliver those and, and keep margins high while we face downward price pressure. Yeah, I love that. I actually, yeah, I'm talking to a founder right now who's doing something very similar in the pricing world. Um, but yeah, no, this is this is really, really good stuff. Uh, would you say that, um, I feel like what you're talking about when we talk about early stage business models versus maybe later stage uh, business models, it also has to kind of do with with this, the, the classic saying of like early on, do things that are not scalable. And so it's like, you know, you want to be uh, less cash intensive and more sort of uh, be able to generate revenue quickly. Um, and then later on, you're focused on like, how can we, you know, deliver this uh, or a similar service to a much larger number of people. So, you know, like, like you said, you know, <laughs> spending a million dollars to make $200 a month doesn't make sense unless it really takes off. So early on, you might want to have a different business model. And then after that, once you've realized the business model works and you've understand all the nuances, you can deliver that potentially as a SaaS platform and have people pay. Is that the, the concept kind of? Totally the case. I mean, one of the things you're looking for is you're looking for early validation that the customers actually care about what, what you're building. Yeah. And so you brought up price. Price is one of those distinctive pieces that you have to, most, it's interesting, most, the data says most startups don't change their pricing in the first three years, which is tragic, right? Because as a founder, you're like, I know what my little product does and I kind of think of this thing and the fact is it's grown, and, but I'm scared to change pricing, right? So where my recommendation in the, in the book is you should do a quarterly pricing uh, committee and it doesn't mean you're going to change pricing quarterly, but it means you're going to look at the outside market factors and what the competition is doing. And, and you know, there's there's some great examples of like companies that just raise their prices and you know, all of us are freaked as the founders. So we're like, what if customers leave us? And, they're, and the customers are like, we, you should charge more for this a long time ago. Yeah. Right. So, and to your point, there are things that work early and then there's also things that don't work early. And, and what I mean by that is you've got to uh, know that if, for example, you're like, oh, we're going to raise, we're going to make money advertising. Great. Mm -hmm. Advertising is one of the models. But if you don't have a, a, a million unique users a month, the answer is you will die on your way to get a million unique users. Yeah. Right. So, it, again, it works at scale, but at launch, like you're here and you need to get figure out how to get there. And the answer is it just doesn't, it doesn't work. So the other one that's unique and people think about is like, I want to go viral. And that model is called new media. And new media is basically, it's kind of the anti-model technically, right? If you're acquiring customers at such a fast clip, um, the answer is just keep acquiring customers and you'll figure out how to monetize them later, usually in advertising, in the case of Facebook, mm -hmm. right? Or in paid search, which is a slightly different version that Google uses. But the idea is, is those models only work at scale. I'll give you another example, big data. What, big data requires that you have the data to sell. Right? So we had one company in our portfolio in the last venture fund I was with, and they're like, we're going to pivot to the big data model. And I'm like, that's great. How are you going to live for the 18 months while you don't have any revenue? And they're like, yeah. what do you mean? And I'm like, well, big data requires you have the data. You guys are building the data set. So at some point, you can layer that on, but you can't layer it on if you don't have the data to sell today. Yeah, I love that. And, and it, coming back to your advertising kind of example, it's the thing that people I think often forget, and I, I often discourage people to 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 first to start off their companies with an advertising model. And if they do absolutely want to do a, a, a that kind of model, I'm like, find an independent um, sort of brand who wants to actually pay you to have their, you know, and that'll be a better deal for you than to kind of you know uh, work with Google early on. You have to understand basically that if you're going to monetize your product later through ads you're competing against other ad platforms. And we're talking about the most sophisticated ad platforms in the world, YouTube, Facebook, uh, Google Display. Like there are just so many out there. And so you're competing against monsters and you expect to be able to. So it's an interesting thing. So what do you suggest to people who kind of have that advertising uh, model 
and where, you know, like, you know, they're not going to make money early on. Is there like a complementary model that works well usually for these kind of people? Like, is it a subscription? Is it commerce? Is it? Yeah, it depends. I mean, one of the things I always point out to them is like, well, let's do the back of the napkin math first. Yeah. Right. And the back of the napkin math says, OK, well, so what's what are current CPCs? Click, you know, cost per thousand. What are the click through rates? Oh, it's this. And I, I kind of I try to back them into the having them have the aha moment. I, I try to be less pedantic than I used to be. Yeah. And I used to be like, oh, that's a shitty idea. You shouldn't do it. Um, now I'm like, let's do the math and let's see. Right. And then they start, they're like, so how much traffic do you have today? And it's like on a CPM rate of a uh, cost per thousand of a hundred dollars on a CPM rate. Uh, how many thousands do you have? A uh, thousand. Okay. Well, on you know, a hundred dollars per, so you're going to give me a hundred dollars this month. So now how many months can you sustain at basically zero revenue? Um, and then what's my cost of customer acquisition? Well, my cost of customer acquisition is $3. Okay. So you, when you start doing the math, this, this thing I like about the math is the math doesn't lie. Yeah. Right? You're like, someone I, looks at it and they're like, Oh, passion. no, this doesn't look great. Yeah. <laughs> you well, don't have to like convince anyone of anything. They can see it for themselves. Yeah. Just this week I had a, a, a good friend send me a note and they're like, would you look at the business plan for me? Sure, of course. Uh, he's like, it's going to get to a half billion dollars in four years. And I'm like, no. He's like, but but yeah, you don't understand the math. I'm like, yeah, I do. Like, So one of the analysis we did and put in, uh, put in the book was we looked at the Inc. 500 list for the last 10 years. So, so to be in the top 10 of the Inc. 500 list, and we took the average uh, number one company uh, and the average per year, and we basically said, and the Inc. 500 list starts with, you don't start as zero, right? And you're like, I doubled this year. We went from a dollar to two. You have to start with a million dollar base revenue is the start of that. And then they track it over that three year span. And one of the things I tell founders when you're doing your financial model is if your financial model tells you you're going to get to a half billion dollars in three or four years, the answer is you've just shown that you know how to use Excel, but you don't know anything about the business. Right. And so there's a, there's a quiz test for you. Like right? what's the average revenue if you wanted to be in the top five, of the Inc. 500 list in the last 10 years, what sort of revenue would you have to do? And the answer is roughly $40 million. Like if you went from a million to $40 million in three years, or even four years, you would be in the top 10 of the Inc. 500 list. That's the average. Now, is there some outliers? Sure. Like, you know, Groupon, great example of a non-revenue model, by the way. So if you remember all the copies, copycats of Groupon that came out after Groupon did, Ultimately, Groupon's revenue model is commerce and lead generation, right? So they, they're a combination revenue model. But revenue models aren't defensible, right? That's why you saw so many copycats. That people are like, oh, my God, that's a great idea. And there's a local angle to it. And we're, we're going to start. We're just like Groupon, only better. And we're in Cleveland, yeah. right? So, but revenue models aren't defensible, right? You, there's no, you can't build a... A patent around a revenue model. It's just it's the best practice. And, and you've actually helped to democratize all these 14 models too now. So it's it's even more in now like everyone has access to these things and, and you can't patent them. Yep. And that's really the pay-per-click advertising was originally started by a company that came out of Idea Lab and then got sold to Yahoo. And then Google copied it and Yahoo sued them, right? And Yahoo at some point got a massive amount of Google stock <laughs> to settle the lawsuit. But that was that was totally the case of, oh, that's a great revenue model. We'll just copy it. And actually, Yahoo had the company who had the patent on it, and ultimately, said, um, wow. yeah. So it, revenue models work at launch and at scale, and you need to pick the one that is appropriate for your stage of the business, right? And then know that just having a more complex spreadsheet isn't your solution, right? So if it, if the math doesn't work on the the back of the napkin version, adding a more complex spreadsheet is not going to help you. Yeah, I really like that. Um, and, and that's absolutely true in, in my experience, at least. Uh, you know, anyone who's an experienced entrepreneur, no, sorry, uh, investor understands that any sort of um, revenue projections are going to be wrong, right? You're, <laughs> so they just want to see that you have a plan and, and, and understand the, the way that you've thought through that plan. And so your thought process is kind of uh, extracted onto the sheet. And I think that's what uh, investors are often looking to um to look into more than actually the numbers themselves because they know they're going to be wrong right yeah it's just to understand the basic math and to yeah. as an investor we know they're 
wrong. This is really just a question of orders of magnitude wrong. Like how wrong, right? So, it, but it is an exercise in a, in a discipline of like, where are you going to spend the money and when would you spend the money and what are the critical hires? And, uh, you know, I think the way that we look at it now as an investor is how does it foot? Like, do you have a quarterly plan that says these are critical hires and these are critical releases? And then does that map to when you get your revenue and when you're going to spend the money on the engineers to build it or the contract firm to, to build it? So we kind of look at it now and go, does it kind of map to your quarterly plan or not? Yeah. So it's an exercise and a discipline you need to have, but it's probably not, well, to your point, it's just wrong, right? But you're like, if you get your basic assumptions down, um, so that turned into a series of templates that you can find on the site as well. That's like, here, just go, there's nothing worse than starting with a blank template, like, or a blank, you know, you're looking at cell 1A and flashing cursor at you and you're like, damn, I got to go build a model from scratch. So there's a bunch yeah. of templates there as well. I did post in the in the notes for folks the, the link to the 16, 16, it's actually 14 now. So we, we killed a couple of them. So there was a thing called panels. So, and, and that really is just a marketplace. Uh, mm -hmm. There are multi-sided marketplaces. It's really just a marketplace. So we've seen very few changes over the, the last five, six years of it, which has been super interesting. Uh, licensing is one that is in the process of dying, but it's still around. But, you know, 15 years ago, Microsoft was super concerned about like, oh, if we go from licensing to subscription, is like the market going to treat us? And the answer is the market treated them really well. Yeah. Because recurring revenue subscription has the highest multiple for exit. And that is one point I would make for your audience uh, to Christian is like, if we build a service business that does a million dollars a year, that business is going to sell between three quarters of a million and a million and a half dollars, depending on profitability. But if I build a million dollar recurring subscription business, that business is likely to sell for seven to $12 million. So it, the exit multiple is hugely different. Mm -hmm. right? And because recurring revenue versus transaction fee revenue, transaction fee comes in, I pay you once I get my thing. Right. And um, I'm done. So Fiverr is a great example of a marketplace that gets paid a transaction fee, right? I come in, I'm looking for a video editor like you and I were talking about, and I pay that service, they do that service and fee, and I'm done. And I may come back six times a year, that's part of my key metric, but I'm not, I'm not paying a monthly subscription. And the monthly subscription businesses just produce better results. Yeah, yeah, and that's why like so many people really got uh, excited about B2B subscription models, MRR, like there was like a huge explosion and like everyone just wanted to be a SaaS company that had MRR basically. Yeah, for and sure, it has the best multiple. Yeah, yeah, so that that totally makes sense. And also it's like, and then there's the other thing, right? You have to, when you have that case, one of your biggest uh, worries, the thing that doesn't make you sleep at night, it's basically churn, right? Like, uh, do you have, um, that, that might be an interesting segment. Are there any recommendations on like uh, strategies to minimize churn that you've seen successful in these types of businesses? Yeah, I mean, one of the big things is if you look at um, customer success as part of your sales process. So customer success isn't really a customer service role. It's really part of the sales role. Because mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm looking at how do I stem my churn from the early days and what things do I put into place to, to mitigate my churn. And the, the positive out positive way to stay churn is is my annual contract value going up? Is Am I upgrading you within the tiers of pricing? So the, the concept there is net negative churn. So and I've seen a bunch of companies where like, you know, they're, um, they have net negative churn, which means their annual contract value goes up on an annual basis, or they're able to upgrade their customer from one tier pricing to another tier pricing, but you can actually calculate it on, on net negative churn. Um, and businesses that have ne net negative churn, right? I can forecast that revenue out. And if I can forecast the revenue out, I can give you a valuation based on future revenue. So future 12 versus trailing 12. Yeah. Right? And that's how I spend most of my time today when I'm not working on a book is helping uh, startup founders sell, right? And the first question is always, well, what's my company worth? How much can I sell it for? And the answer is, it varies a lot and it comes down, revenue models is a big part of that, right? And yeah. how much visibility you have into your revenue and how much forecastability you have uh, gets us into a conversation of, you know, a future value versus the historic value. And yeah. that's, that's the right dialogue to have if you're gonna sell. Absolutely, and I, I totally agree with you. Different models have different values, but then it's also a buyer's market where it's just basically like, it's whatever someone's gonna offer you to pay for it. And so if you're in a situation where you have several buyers who could be interested and you're 
positioning yourself strategically, you'll be able to get a higher valuation exit than you would if there was only really one buyer and not that many people are excited. And it's oftentimes, I think that some of the big exits that happen are because they literally don't want to lose out to the other guy buying that company and creating having a set. Is huge. Like Which one? Huge. Creating competition in that process is huge. Yeah. So we have another, I'll close on my 10th transaction tomorrow. Right. So. Wow. Congratulations. Thanks. Thanks. I'm not, I'm, I'm helping. I'm an advisor on the company. I'm helping to do the sell side merger and acquisition stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting deal for all the things that you mentioned. Right. So, but if you only have one potential buyer, you're going to be limited in your price. So what you're really doing is you're creating the first anchor buyer and then you're rallying a process to go get as much, much interest as you can, or at least perceived interest in the market. Right. So your one buyer doesn't know that they're the only one. Right. So you can try to drive the price up. And historically, we see about a 50 percent bump. Right. Is if you can create a competitive process, th the numbers matter. And a lot of founders are like, I want to go do it myself. And I'm like, I, you know, I think you want to return maximum value for your efforts. And most of us, you know, there were seven to 15 year overnight success stories. Right. If you look at the average timeline. And if the first seven years, nobody even knows you're around. And then after the seventh year, people are like, oh, my God, this is an overnight success story. You're like, I've been pushing this ball uphill every long freaking time. Yeah. But if you're a founder and you've gotten to the point at which, like, the exit is happening, I think, and this, you might tell me I'm completely wrong, but, like, I feel like you have a little bit, you've, you've learned how to trust other people's experience as well. Um, and, and you've learned how to lean on that a little bit more. So it's like you're less like, I want to be involved in every single thing, right? Because you've already learned how to hire people who are better than you at pretty much everything in the business. <laughs> you're yeah. kind of the CEO, yeah. right? Uh, well, hopefully. I, know I have control issues you still, yeah. right? But um, to your point, I think the, the idea there is that one of my board members early in my career said, hire professionals for what they do, right? Especially lawyers and bankers. Because you, it's, you're, running a, you're running a process that's different than running a business. And it's very distracting, right? So I mean, the deals that um, the deals that are tough are the deals where you know the founders trying to do everything, and then they miss their numbers uh, for the quarter of the month before the close, and then all of a sudden you're you're looking at is my valuation going to get whacked? Do you know is the deal going to go sideways? Those you know the distraction factor on the sale process is huge, right? It's just it's a lot of work. That's so interesting. No, it's it's fascinating. So I mean. You know, we've talked about a number of things now. Um, you hold all these different hats. You've really held like you've built companies as the CEO. You've started some from scratch. You've come in and helped them grow. You've, you know, mentored as kind of a board member, as a mentor, advisor, all these different roles. Um, from that, what would be kind of some, you know, recommendations when it comes to early stage entrepreneurs? Like, what is your advice today? Uh, that you give when you when you speak to some of these um, you know newly uh, newly accomplished sort of yeah I founders. Think one is kind of get plugged into your community and recognize there's people founders like you in your community that are asking the same questions you're asking and you don't always have to come to the you know the answer man or a mentor to to find it like be part of building a community around you we're we're also heads down focused more building our companies that we forget that there's other people out there like you and others who are like asking the same questions. So create a create that peer group. If it doesn't exist in your community yet, I would encourage you to, to be part of building it. When I started my first company in 98, it's not like Bill, Bill Gates and, and Jeff Bezos were giving back to the startup community, right? Um, but I think there's a, a chance in, to be part of that community and invest in the community. And um, I'm much more of a community builder now than I was early in my career. And I think I and there's some of that's about over mentoring because it was so hard to find a mentor in '98 that knew, you know, e-commerce and you know it's just like it was a different world. Yeah. Uh, but there's going to be a whole different set of different challenges that your first-time founders are going to face now, right? That I didn't have to face, right? And people are always like, there's people tend to be super critical of their startup ecosystem. Like, here's all of the deficiencies we have. You know, Seattle's like we don't have a lot of early stage investors and our startup ecosystem is really bad. And I'm like, Oh my God, you should have been here in 98. Like it's really good now. Like, <laughs> you know, we always look at Silicon Valley and say, why aren't we Silicon Valley? Or, and the answer was, well, we didn't start in 1971. Right. Yeah. So I'll just came out with a new book on startup communities. I encourage people to be, you're going to be part of a community, whether you're building community or whether you're building your company. 
So be aware of that first and foremost, because you're going to find other people like you. And that's, that's a huge support. Yeah. yeah. Support. Yeah. Very super important. Yeah. I think that's and key. Mentors who actually have experience is a yeah. mentors who are trying to sell you something. Right. So, uh, yeah. you know, I, I tend to give a lot of time to folks, but I also am, am aware at some point, like, Hey, you're, you're abusing the, the circumstance, right? There's comes a point where, and what I mean by that is if, if you're willing to go do the work, mentors are totally willing to support you. But if I ask you to go do something and you want to meet me again, and I'm like, so what you, what progress? Cause I, I'm kind of weird. I actually remember what I asked. Right. <laughs> so, like, so did you go do that thing? And they're like, Oh no, it's hard. And I'm like, well, why are you asking to meet me again? Like, that's the thing you need to go do next. Yeah. I guess the customer cares about your product. Like go do 25 customer interviews and let's talk again. Yeah. But oh, no, that was hard. So I want to, I want to meet with you again. Like my opinion hasn't changed. So there's, there's, there's a small percentage of founders that are just kind of crazy. Right. And, and there, and we get a bad rap for that in the startup community, but there's also a bunch of founders who I think are out doing the work and mentors want to, we want to be there and help and support, but talk to people who have actually been there and done that versus consultants or, you know, people who like, you know, want to, especially the fundraising for a fee folks, like, Hey, I'll help you go fundraise and I'll introduce you to a bunch of angels. And I want 6% of whatever we raise Just say no to that, like run away. Those are, yeah. the, we, we call those the leeches in the startup community, right? Yeah. They don't actually do anything. They don't sponsor anything. They show up at events that other people have sponsored, right? And are there to try to sell you something and just run away from those folks. They're completely useless. Usually they start bringing out big names as well. Like, oh, I did this university or anything they can leech on to. Um, I agree. That's that's also happened to me, um, you know, in previous startups. Um, so that's, no, I think that we've kind of done a bit the rounds here. I think that um, in terms of like, maybe just a little word in, because I do have um, quite a few sort of, um, people who are in the investment community, um, what would you advise to someone who's kind of looking to start getting into the angel game? I know there's such a huge community and these people are not trained at all. Um, they're kind of going out and trying to figure it out on their own. Um, what would be advice towards like a first time investor? Yeah, I mean, the, the Angel Capital uh, Association, the ACA, is, is a great forum for you to learn more about being a, an investor. I think the you know, some of the areas we see that are a huge challenge early on in investors is you need to you need to follow somebody who's actually a lead investor. Um, and I think this is where angel investors get a bad, bad rap is they they pretend to be lead investors, but they're really tire kickers and they're waiting for somebody else to lead the investment. So I think it's OK. Like in Seattle, we have the Seattle Angel Conference, which is a forum that's set up for early or for potential investors to consider angel investing. And the process is kind of super arduous for the founders, right? Because this, this process isn't really about the founders. The process is about gearing up and building the next generation of angel investors. So consequently, it feels like they're doing series B level due diligence on a series C level deal. And it frustrates founders until they realize, oh, well, this is actually a program designed to train angels, right? I'm just, I'm just the product that they're showing off. And the answer is, yes, you've got it. You are kind of, yeah, they still write checks. Right, but they're early angel investors trying to learn their way through it. There's, there's a lot of our own lingo in this whole thing of like, oh, is it a series seed one or a series seed three? Is it a participating preferred or is it a safe? And it's like yeah. all that stuff that I live with every day from a restructuring perspective or having to do a fundraising round. But if you're new to it, it's not like buying Amazon stock. Yeah. Right, which is liquid today and I can trade it after hours. And because when I jump into an angel deal, I'm going to be in that deal seven to 10 years. Like, so I, I really need to like you as the founder. I need to, I need to love the business. I should be able to explain it to my spouse because they're going to be part of that decision-making process. Yeah. Right. So I think just be, find an organization or find somebody in your community who's already doing angel investing and tag along. Yeah. Um, happy to have you like love new angel investors. They're awesome. Um, every once in a while you'll see some weird terms or something. And it's like, they basically have made the deal unfundable in the future. Cause if I come in along as an institutional investor, I ran a family office fund for three years, uh, super high net worth individual and, and then worked at a venture fund and a couple of different venture funds. We'd come across these deals and we're like, you got to fix that. Like some, wh whatever that angel did, like structure that deal. Like that's, 
we won't invest in that. Yeah. But now you have to fix it and pay for the legal fees to fix it. So it's best to figure out like the ACA has docs, there's standard docs, like they're super vanilla. There's uh, a thing called series seed docs, which um, Cooley Goddard wrote with, I think, Wilson Sincini. They're yeah. available on GitHub. Like they're open sourced documents. Yeah, Cooley Go as well is like basically yeah. they, they host them all there. You can actually go in there and type in your own stuff. So yeah, that's another thing, right? People spend so much money on legal documentation when yeah. you just have great templates out there. Angel stage check for 25 or 50 grand. I don't want six grand of it to go to legal or 10 grand. Yeah. Oh, and, and, and what you described is the classic example of someone who doesn't have experience investing because if they did, they would understand that they have to make the deal investable in the future. It's in their interest to, to, to grow the valuation of the company for their own sort of you know investment multipliers. Um, so that's clearly, yeah. And and the classic example that, that you, I think one of the first questions I guess when investors are like considering uh, investing and they don't know about the tech world, they're like, no, but what's the valuation? What's the exact valuation? What do you mean there's no valuation? You know, when you talk about safe, safe notes or like <laughs> uh, convertible notes, it's like they can't wrap their head around that because they've been part of a world where it's like, all about like you know the, the free cash flow um, sort of methodology of of, um, of finding yeah. out valuation. It's, you know uh, net present value calculation on future cash flows. There's actually Dave Berkus uh, wrote um, a methodology 20 years ago called the Berkus method, B E R K U S. And uh, I've been a closet uh, fanboy of Dave for years. And I actually reached out to him because I quoted him a couple times in the book. And I reached out to him and said, hey, you don't know me, but I, I'm a total fanboy lurker, right? Like, could I send you the book and would you write a blurb on the book? And because I've quoted you in these two places and like uh, one of my mentors early in my career uh, quoted, which I didn't know at the time was Berkus, was like where there's mystery, there's margin. And the inverse of that is true too, where there's no mystery, there's no margin. Yeah. So as the internet has made data sets widely available, right, is, to your point, it's, it's democratized pricing, right? So that's been a great thing for our community, but in emerging markets, we see a lot more marketplaces because that's still pretty opaque data sets. But what Dave did in the Berkus method was he basically said, is it a good idea? That's kind of worth, you know, 300K. Do you have a whole team that's kind of worth 250K? So he basically, you know, created this method where it's like, they're all heuristics, to your point. There's no it's not, it's not math from a valuation perspective. There's a set of heuristics, and I would call it a little, little bit like a soccer pitch. You can either be on the field and in the sidelines and the end zones, or you can be up in the fans, in the seats, right, with completely unrealistic numbers, or you can be out in the street, right? And what happens on the angel investing side is uh, we, have a, we have a monthly angel call that we do with early stage VCs, and people are like, oh yeah, I saw Krishna's deal. I thought it was overpriced. So now every angel in Seattle goes, oh, yeah, Christmas deal. When I see it, I know it's overpriced. And it's all because the founder went out and said, we think we're worth $10 million. And you're like, why? Right? And it's like, because yeah. we're testing pricing. It's like, that's a bad place to test pricing, right? So, uh, you know, founders talk about angel investors amongst the founders. Angel investors talk about founders amongst the angels. Like, we're all looking for signal to noise. And I think that's just part of the process. And it's part of why you have to work on, you know, being out in the community and engaging and building relationships and versus like sitting in your home on your keyboard and building products. The answer is yeah. Yeah, in the building, go talk to customers. Right. It'll, it'll, yeah. it'll, and then to your point, like understand the other people who are sitting on the other sides of the table of you, whether those are customers, of course, that's the first thing you're going to do when building your startup, but also the investors, also the strategic partners, like, uh, understand their point of view so it's easy for easier for you to fit in within that model or just to be like you know what maybe that's not for me um, yeah i think i'd leave you with one of the big lessons learned for me is i flew to to new york with my first startup at one point we were growing crazy like we went from zero to 32 million in in three years and 42 million in the fourth year and you know three people to 150 people it was just it was i made lots of mistakes and i went to go meet with warburg pincus and warburg pincus is one of the largest private equity funds and Samantha Chan was the MD at the time and mm -hmm. I went met with Samantha and you know, walked her through our pitch and she was walking me to the elevator and she said, you know, Dave, I, I love your passion for the market. We like this market, but I can't repeat your message to my partners, so I won't. And, you know, I'm going down the elevator just like, oh my God, I flew to New York for this one meeting and 
you know, time and hotel and flight and, right? But the lesson learned was huge. And the lesson learned was you're gonna meet with somebody who has to repeat your message to get an investment. And they can walk away with like, oh, I can do that. Like I can repeat what We Are No Code does. Or I can walk away going, wow, Christian's super smart, but I have no idea what he does. And sadly for founders, it, we tend that way. Like we're in our heads and we see the future as if it exists right today. And we're super passionate about it and we don't want to listen. And so people walk away going, gosh, I wish them well, but I don't really understand what they're doing. Yeah. Right? Or, you know, the, the, the best case example of she was super senior in the MD right, is you're going to meet with a junior associate whose future at that venture capital firm is based on their ability to rightly articulate or smartly articulate your idea. And then Christian comes to me and says, hey, Dave, did you see any interesting deals this week? And I'm like, hmm, I saw this deal over here, but I can't really explain it. And if I do, it'll make me look like a dumbass, which means my boss will think I'm an idiot. So I'm just going to say, nope, didn't see any interesting deals this week, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that's a huge gaining factor for founders is like, can somebody repeat your message or not? And that's part of how you should gauge your success of your pitch yeah. is I, I'm not going to, I hear there are people who in the very first meeting wrote a check. I have never personally experienced that. Yeah. Right. I agree. I haven't either. To the next meeting and, and consequently somebody needs to go, Oh yeah, I saw that deal. These guys are doing this thing. Yeah, and it's the same thing with it, like sales, specifically like enterprise sales and stuff like that, where you need someone to be able to communicate to all these other stakeholders, like what the hell you're doing and the benefits. And well, so you have to be very, very clear and yeah. very simple so that people can get it and they can be your ambassadors internally to start selling it to the right people. Dave, this was amazing. I, I mean, before we uh, part ways, uh, can you let us know where we could find you, where the people watching can find you? Yeah, you can uh, get trajectory.com is the, the website for the new book series. You can also find me at dkparker.com. So just www.dkparker.com. Um, and it has all the all the blog posts. So if you want to pre-read the book, you just have to figure out what the sequence of the 150 blog posts are. But that's, that's really it. Um, <laughs> and then we'll, there's, uh, if you want to get on the, the pre-registration for the book, you can do that on gettrajectory.com. We'll, Pre-sales will start for that in um, December, January. Uh, it'll be out March 4th, but thanks so much for the invite and the time and excited about what you're doing and, uh, and hopefully the audience found something useful. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I love bringing on guests who just have, have dedicated the amount of energy that you have towards making this a better startup ecosystem. And so I really appreciate you coming and taking your time. Um, you know, I know that you're doing a lot of different things. Uh, I know that the audience is going to absolutely love this. We are going to chop this on into lots of little awesome bites. I will be sharing your templates with every one of my startup students as well. Uh, I think the work you're doing is fantastic and thanks so much uh, for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> cool. Well, with that, thanks to all the viewers and we'll see you guys on the next episode. Take care.